using the, the European synchrotron, and both made remarkable progress. So the first speaker is going to be John Wright, who's, who's now uh, a scientist working on the ID-11 beamline at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, and he's going to be dealing with some of the more technical aspects, the uh, recent technical developments in, in protein powder diffraction. So, thanks Andy for this uh, introduction. Uh, I'll just try to figure out how to turn this off. Uh, there's a plug somewhere. There, there we go, at the top. There we go. So, uh, technical developments on uh, proteins and powders. So it's nine o'clock, it's Monday morning, and uh, normally I should, I should hit you with some really tough equations around about now. But uh, I asked around in, in the tutorial groups and uh, seeing what different people are presenting, what kind of research people are doing, I think it would only be the, uh, the, the other teachers on the school that would appreciate equations. So I'll try to go through with a, with a kind of gentle introduction and I'll try to mainly focus on how the work that we've done on, on proteins fits into the rest of powder diffraction and how this fits into the rest of crystallography. And then we've tried to synchronize with Irene so that when she comes on next, the, the second half of our double act, she'll explain what it is that we've actually done and show some of the more scientific results. So, and also I'd like to thank very much to Bill and, and, and to Ken in organizing this to give us the chance to show here what's been going on uh, in this field of research. So to begin, uh, when I started, I didn't know what a protein was. I was working in uh, inorganic chemistry and magnetic structures, and so uh, one of the first things was to learn something about proteins and what they are. So a very, a very brief introduction is that they're uh, the molecules that make up all, all kinds of living things, your muscles, your blood, uh, everything in the body, or many things in the body are made of proteins, and they're, they're a polymer, so it's a chain of molecules. Uh, and it's a chain of these amino acids, and they, uh, they bond together making peptide bonds. So unfortunately, my nitrogens have turned white. These should be blue nitrogens, of course, and, and red oxygens there. And so this amino acid is, is a carbon here, and a, an oxygen here, and a nitrogen here. And this C-alpha is because there's a, there's a chiral center there and another chiral center there. And you have this, this group that hangs off the side of the polymer chain. So this long polymer chain has different things hanging off the side. So here's a kind of schematic picture from Wikipedia of one of, of one of these proteins. And hanging off the side of each one of these little circles, there's one of these R groups. And there are, there are 20 or so, or 22 kinds of R groups that occur naturally in nature. But there are only 22 kinds of R groups. So in the last uh, 50 or 100 years, these molecules have been studied in very great detail, and the structures of these things are very well known. So the, all, all proteins, or almost all proteins, large parts of the structures, the internal ge geometry is very well known, the bond distances, the bond angles, torsions, and things. So because we have all of this information about the short-range structure, uh, we can do fairly low-resolution crystallography. So in, in most of the things I think I've seen people presenting, they'll look for where are all of the atoms in the structure. So this kind of picture up here, where you would really want to see where is every single atom in the structure, what's every single bond distance inside the structure, and you know, what are all of the details. Uh, with a protein structure, once you figure out where the, where the polymer chain is going and which side group is in which conformation, then you're kind of finished because y if you find that your tryptophan doesn't look quite right, then just nobody will believe your structure. So you can get away with these kind of lower resolution pictures uh, where you see how does, the, how does the chain fold up? What's, say, the, just the hydrogen bonding that's holding together these helices uh, and bits of beta sheet and so on. And you can do interesting biology and interesting science even with this lower res level of resolution where you don't really see all of the atoms that are inside the structure. So that's a, a brief introduction to what's a protein and, and what's protein crystallography. So what was a, a huge surprise for many people, uh, back in 1999, Bob, who's sitting at the very back, hiding in the corner, uh, published this uh, structure refinement of, of myoglobin. So this was, this was a huge surprise for, for many of us, or certainly for me. 
And it was an extremely impressive piece of work because nobody had really imagined that you would try to apply powder diffraction to such a complicated structure and that it would actually hold together and you'd get something useful out. So one of the aspects is that you get these very, very high quality powder diffraction patterns with extremely sharp diffraction lines. Uh, so you have a lot of very rich information in the powder diffraction pattern from a protein. And you may not have expected that they would give these, these, these good diffraction patterns, so you would have some information to start with. And then in order to, to put the crystal structure in and to get everything to hold together in the refinement, Bob actually went ahead and in, in invented new kinds of restraints uh, fitting onto this Rama, Ramachandran plot of uh, how the torsion angles along the backbone hold the structure together. So when, when you have, a, say, an alpha helix, it means that you have particular positions in these torsion angle plots where, where the, the torsion angles like to go, and that's how the thing folds up into alpha helix, and that's how the structure can be kind of held together is by putting these new kind of restraints in. So Bob put all of this together into his GSAS software package, and then in order to stimulate the field, or because he's just uh, a great guy, I guess, he gave this away for everyone to use, and also he helped us and, and got us started explaining how to use the program and how to get going. And I remember feeling kind of overwhelmed because I'd done refinements of small organic molecules before, and whichever program you use, this, this series of putting in all of the bond restraints by hand and putting in all of the angle restraints by hand, uh, figuring all of that stuff out was, was really horrible. And the thought of doing that for a thousand atom structure, it just seemed inconceivable that you'd be able to put together this kind of Rietveld refinement and get something meaningful out. And it turns out with proteins, as, as I was just explaining, all of the molecules are kind of the same. It's actually much easier to get going with a protein refinement than it is with, say, an inorganic or a, an organic where, where the, the geometry is not so well known. So to get started, if you, if you get hold of a data set and if you have one of these PDB files with the model in, then you'll have all of the atomic positions. So you put your data into GSAS as normal. So I tried to do a tutorial level introduction here. Uh, you'd probably do something like a labile fit or a poly fit to try and refine the, 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 the peak shape and the unit cell parameters. And when you have this, this, this data where you have lots and lots of peaks at high angles and you're doing these kind of fits, a very good tip to get started is if you only fit the very low angle data, then you're not so sensitive to the, to the errors in, say, lattice parameters that you get the wrong peaks locking in uh, and, and giving you false minima. So if you start just with the low angle data, and you get a starting fit, and then you gradually put in more and more high angle data, then it tends to be easier to get started. So then to read in your atoms, you just give it the name of the file, and all of a sudden you've got you know, 1,247 atoms have been read into GSAS, and you haven't really had to type very much except the name of the file where they've got to come from. So there's the name, you just type in the name of the file, and it, it tells you, you know, is, it, is that the file you really mean? And you say you know, yes and no to these various different questions. And then all of a sudden, you have your entire protein, and it's in there, and it's, it's kind of ready to go. So you could go off, and you could try to, do, try to see how well does that fit your data. So if you do that, you'll, you'll be quite disappointed, because it won't fit your data at all well. And this was something else that was a, a big shock for me with protein structures, is that when you take the atomic models from the data bank and you put them against powder data, they don't give you anything like what you actually measure. So the, the deposited atomic structures will almost always have these really strong peaks at low angles. Uh, and the data that you measure probably won't have these really strong peaks. And, and this just doesn't match up at all. And, and the reason for this is this issue of solvent scattering. So this is that your protein molecules, when, when we do protein crystal structures, your protein molecule uh, should be floating in water. So if you think of, say, the hemoglobin in your blood, this, uh, this protein molecule, it's floating around in water and salt and so on inside your blood. And when you want to look at the protein in the crystal structure, you want to keep it floating around in water with salt and all of this other stuff floating around so that you're looking at you know, the molecule as it really works. So when you grow protein crystals or when you persuade your proteins to crystallize, you'll do this in, in, in some water with some buffers and salts and so on. And inside of the crystal structure, you have these large open channels, like in the kind of zeolite structures or in the MOF frameworks. But in a protein crystal, they'll be full of liquid water. 
And when you measure the structure at room temperature, this water is flowing around up and down the channels, and the molecules don't keep still. Uh, and so you have this kind of, inside of the channels, you have this uniform electron density, these flat regions of, of electron density inside the structure. And so your, 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 say, carbon atoms that are in your crystal structure, instead of it being a carbon atom sitting in vacuum, you have a carbon atom which is sitting, floating in some water. So it's essentially, it displaces the water from around it, and it makes kind of a hole in the, in the water electron density, and then there's a little peak where your carbon atom is. So the way that Bob put into GSAS that you could fit this is that you can just modify the atomic form factor for carbon. So you have the regular form factor, which would be this uh, red curve up here, and then you have this contribution of the solvent, which is the green curve. So you have this uniform solvent everywhere, and then once you put your protein in, it makes a hole in the solvent where the protein has gone. And so you add these two contributions together, and, and you get this funny-looking form factor, which goes even a little bit negative down here, because you made a hole in the solvent. And then it goes up to being positive, and then, and then it levels off. And if you put this in, and if, if you uh, get the numbers about right, then you end up with something that starts to look pretty much like the, the data that you record. And so this is something that, that, that's really important. And I guess this comes back to what Lynn was explaining as, as well with the zeolites. Uh, it's really the low angle peaks that change a great deal when you do this kind of thing. But to get your fit started, you want to get your, your scale factor and your solvent scattering and all of, all of the other things matching as well as you possibly can before you try to refine anything inside of the crystal structure. Because, of course, it's a very complicated crystal structure with, with many degrees of freedom. You don't want to start refining if you're not uh, in, in as good shape as you can be to begin with. So then the restraints, this was the thing that I was really nervous about, but thinking to do a refinement of a protein is how on earth was it going to be possible to go and put all of the restraints in? And if you think you have, you know, 1,200 atoms, then the number of distances and bond angles and torsion angles and so on is, is even bigger than that. Uh, and so Bob invented this system that you could go through and search through the structure according to which kind of amino acid residue that you have inside the structure. So he's programmed in all of the chemistry of those 22 amino acids. And GSAS actually knows the name of the atoms and how they kind of behave. So this is the carbon alpha of a glycine. So inside these, these macros, it knows the bond angles that go with the carbon alpha of a glycine. It, it, it knows the bond distances. It knows the chiral volume to keep the, the, the thing of being left-handed or right-handed. It knows how the Ramachandran plot should look, and it knows how the torsion angle should look on, on the side chains. And where there are planar groups, it knows how to put the planar groups in. So you can get almost all of your geometry set up in a fairly automatic way. So you should not be put off by thinking this is difficult. In a sense, this is actually easier than refining the kind of MOF structures or zeolite structures that I see presented at the conference. Uh, if you do have some groups like hemes or some ligands, then you can do those bits manually. And then that's just like the kind of regular structures that people do all the time. So as I was saying, you should get a good fit before you start doing your refinement. You should check that the restraints have worked out OK, and they actually fit with your initial model, that what you put in to begin with is about right. And you should get your solvent sorted out, your background sorted out, and your scale factor. And then you do some kind of magic in the mathematics to, to stop the thing flying apart too much. Uh, you put a matrix bandwidth to, to make the thing uh, uh, faster computationally, and you should say, uh, you know, knock on wood and say, you know, cross your fingers. And, and then hopefully the thing will refine and you'll end up with a better structure than what you had when you started off. So with GSAS, you can get a nice refinement of the crystal structure if you, if you have uh, a good model to start with. So if you found most of the atoms and, and you can get different Fourier maps and so on and you can try to complete. Uh, in the meantime, in the last uh, well, 12 years now since Bob published. There's been a little bit of, of other developments. So using Topaz, I think Topaz has become the, the well, should we say the golden boy program of, uh, of powder diffraction with, I say, all of the cool kids use Topaz nowadays. Uh, so I say that because Eve is our PhD student, and Eve is kind of the cool kid doing uh, powder diffraction on proteins with us now. And, and together with Andy, they wrote a nice introduction to how you can use Topaz uh, together with protein data. And you can do uh, rigid bodies. There's some solvent scattering in there. You can read the PDB files. And there are some things I think he said about doing grid searching and so on. 
Uh, there's another program, PropPal, uh, which was just published recently. Uh, I think Kenny Stahl seems to be the, 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 the guy that's doing the software there. Uh, and in that case, they have a slightly different way to do the solvent correction, where they, they take an electron density map and they calculate the electron density of the solvent and they do a Fourier transform of that. And also, they worked a little bit on the Lorentz correction for, for laboratory powder diffractometers. So if you collect data from very, very large structures on a lab diffractometer, uh, they made some changes to the way they did uh, a Lorentz correction so you could get a better fit on the very low angle peaks. So I recommend to, to look at this if, if you're looking at very large structures uh, with lab data. So the software progress, this, this was a slide from Eve recently when he defended his PhD thesis in Grenoble. And so we try to work together with protein crystallographers. So we're people that know about powder diffraction. And then there are people that know all about proteins and protein crystallography. And these people come with the samples. And what they look for is, is a pipeline or a, a, a recipe book where you can go through and you can follow one step after the next step to try to get to your structure or your data analysis in a standardized way. And so there's, there's various bits of progress for, say, indexing the structures, for doing some simple, simple modeling and rigid body fitting. You can do this, this with Topaz, and it's relatively user-friendly, uh, especially if you have the commercial version and you can click on things and so on. You can, you can index most things. There were these old tricks years ago where you used to have to lie to the program and, and change the wavelength and so on to convince it that it could index such a large cell. Th these are kind of a thing of, a part of the past now. Then there's this intensity extraction and molecular replacement. This is something where we use a specific program called PROD in Grenoble, and, and that's kind of my fault because I worked on PROD for many years. And as Eve says, this is kind of a horrible step because the only way that you can get to use PROD very well is that you have to keep phoning me and asking me how it works and what you should do with it. So this needs a graphical interface and probably needs a bit more documentation. <coughs> or we just need to get the algorithms that are in PROD into some of the other programs. Uh, then you can do molecular replacement. So if you, if you have a very similar molecule, uh, you can usually find with single crystal software uh, where is your molecule in the unit cell, and that can give you a starting point to do refinements and so on. Uh, and then you can try to do the Rietveld refinement. So Eve says this is a very difficult step. Despite what I just went through, and said it's actually very easy to set up. The problem is to know when to stop or when to abandon your refinement. So as you're doing your refinement, the structure should improve, but you're never quite sure if it really is better, if it's really correct, if you could put another water molecule here or not. Uh, and so that can be quite time consuming. Something which Bob's recently introduced, which uh, I, I haven't seen in the manual, but uh, it's a fantastic feature, is that you can put Z matrix uh, restraints and constraints in. So something that is very convenient is that you can, the Z matrices that have been explained in, in several talks, you now have macros to set up how, how do all the side chains and go on, so in terms of, of Z matrices. And this holds together your structure and gives you many fewer variables to refine, so it makes everything a bit more stable. And there's some uh, ideas about extracting intensities and using single crystal software and recycling. And the reason for this is basically because the single crystal software is very fast and it has lots of magic tricks to do with likelihood in it. And so that's more useful when your structure is quite poor, when you don't actually fit the data. When you start to fit the data and you have the correct structure, then you're probably better doing, doing least squares in GSAS. But when you're at the starting point and things just don't match up, then these least squares algorithms don't tend to improve your structure very much, but they just kind of pull it apart. And then the last point here, we use a program called Coot or, or WinCoot for, for rebuilding the model and, and viewing. And so you can see the electron density very nicely in this program. And you know you can change the mouse wheel and the electron density contours change and so on. Uh, and this is very convenient. And I think you can use this for non-protein structures as well. Uh, and GSAS actually gives you maps that you can read and see in 3D. So to link to the rest of powder diffraction, what is it about proteins that we're doing uh, that's a little bit different to the, to the regular structures? It's just that the unit cells are very big. We have lots of atoms in the structure, and it's very, very large structures. And so you're taking this 3D reciprocal space. So I've tried to make a picture of reciprocal space here. You have this 3D grid of data points in reciprocal space. Uh, and you're condensing this into a 1D powder pattern, as, as many people have explained. So in the very center of reciprocal space, near the origin, you have just a few peaks. 
And as you go further and further out, you have more and more and more peaks. And this is something that I guess you'll see if you just look at powder diffractions. These little tick marks under the pattern get closer and closer together at high angles, and you have more and more and more peaks. And it just gets worse and worse and worse as you try to go to higher angles or further out into reciprocal space. So that, what I've said there is the density of peaks goes as something like h squared. So as you go to higher angles, it gets, it gets worse like quadratically. And I've put here best case 1,000 peaks. So the very best powder diffraction patterns that I've ever seen have got about 1,000 peaks in them. And I think it would be cool if we, could, if we could actually prove what this number should be based on resolution functions or delta Ds over Ds or so on. But I didn't succeed to do it. But I mean, in prod, in the program, I can have 60,000 peaks in, uh, in an intensity extraction. And that's no problem. I can have that many tick marks, and the program runs, and it takes quite a long time. But at the end, when you go through and you say, well, well how many of those are overlapped? And how many kind of wiggles do I really have? Or how do you do this peak counting? There's been a lot of discussion about how you should count the peaks. But I never saw something that really convinced me it was more than about 1,000 coming from the pattern. So this leads you to say, well, if I have about 1,000 peaks, then the kind of resolution, the kind of detail level that I can see inside a crystal structure should be something like the unit cell parameter divided by 10. So to try to explain where that comes from, and why we worry about it is when we want to look at the structures and see what information we can extract, and especially when we talk to protein crystallographers, they want to know what's this angstrom's resolution they'll see in real space. So if we say we can get 1,000 peaks if we have a really, really good pattern, then this corresponds to 10 times 10 times 10 pieces of information somehow. And we may have more diffraction peaks in the powder data. It may go further. You may actually see what wiggles in your diffraction pattern at higher resolution. You don't have the same information you have as in a single crystal data set that goes to that resolution. But assuming we can get this fantastic powder pattern that has a 1,000 peaks inside it, then we can try to calculate what resolution would we actually see. So to give an example of how you would do that, you take the, the volume of the unit cell, and then you look at your space group and you say, what's the multiplicity of a general position? Because say for lysozyme, you have eight molecules in the unit cell and they're all the same. So although you have this, this quite large unit cell with 78 angstroms and 38 angstroms, you've got uh, eight molecules in there. So the actual asymmetric unit is a little bit smaller. So you just take the volume of the cell, divide by the general position, the, the multiplicity of the general position, and then take the cube root. So you're going like a times, a times A times A. And you can come out with a number for what's the resolution that you can see. And this number, I believe, is about right. Uh, you can get data that goes significantly further if you have multiple data sets, if you do some nice tricks and so on. But this 3.1 angstrom resolution kind of corresponds to what people see with single crystal data, the kind of things we can see with powder data, which is that at this resolution, we can see where the protein molecules go. We can see where the side chains go in the structure. And we can see where are the water molecules uh, which stick on the sides of the, of the protein sometimes. Not all of them, but we can see many of them. So this is a resolution, a, a level of detail where we can do interesting science. And that's kind of critical. And so then to, to extend this and to see if it actually worked, I, I came up with this thinking uh, about this talk, of what, how the equation would work. So I tried it on, uh, on another example, urate oxidase, that, that Raina will tell you some more details about this. But it was a study of polymorphism in this particular protein. And there are many different polymorphs. So this is table one from the paper by uh, Ines Collings, who, who was with us at, at ESRF for her uh, stagiaire. And uh, I took just the unit cell volumes which are on this row of the table here, uh, and looked at the space groups to see the general position, and looked at the resolution range. So this is how far we actually saw diffraction peaks in the powder pattern. And what we essentially see is that if you, if you calculate this, uh, this little figure that I just showed, how to get the resolution, how, you know, what level of detail can you see in a crystal structure, and I plot that against you know, the observed and the calculated, it kind of follows. So if you go to a really huge crystal structure, if you say, you know, okay, I want to do the ribosome or a virus particle doing powder diffraction, then you can kind of calculate and estimate, you know, what kind of level of detail might you be able to see in your powder data. Uh, and we actually do slightly better for that point there. This is the, uh, the, the orthorhombic one. So we actually observed 
diffraction better than what we would expect coming from this uh, calculation. But of course, at high angles, the peaks are very overlapped. So this is not a hard and fast rule. But it gives you an idea of what you can expect when you start to look at very large structures. So this is another example uh, uh, from Ponson. I hope Reina will show something about this. It, it was a uh, molecular replacement crystal structure of, of a small domain. And so the estimate tells you you should get to about two and a half angstrom. And that's kind of as far as you do get. And as you can see, these, these tick marks are getting very, very, very close together up at high angles. But at two and a half angstrom, you can really start to see quite a lot of detail about the crystal structure. Uh, and you can, you can understand what's going on. So I tried to relate this to the small molecule work that's been going on with structure solution. And this, this, this example was one that I picked up uh, kind of randomly. It's, it's a fairly old example now. And it was one where the direct methods was working and you could get the crystal structure out in, in at the time it says routine. So I don't think it was easy, in fact, but it was something that uh, worked very well. And so you plug in, you know, it's P1 space group and it's got this unit cell volume. You plug those numbers into the equation and it says, you know, if you could get this fantastic quality powder diffraction pattern with a thousand peaks in, then you should have something like a 0.64 angstrom structure. So that's the kind of thing you could send as a single crystal structure to act to C with all of your ADPs refined and all of your hydrogens placed and they should be quite happy with that because that's kind of a standard resolution for single crystal structures. Uh, so if you try that on whatever structure you're working on, this may give you an idea, especially if you've come from the single crystal world, what you can kind of expect to get out of your diffraction patterns. So I'll try to press on and, and go a bit quicker. So how can we do better? Well, we want to improve, of course, this, this resolution limit. We want to do better. And one of the, the things that we've worked on a lot is to have many diffraction patterns at the same time and, and exploit having multiple patterns and doing combined refinements and so on. So we could do that using the preferred orientation of the crystals. We can vary the temperature. Ken's already gone through the anisotropic thermal expansion. There's pH, there's pressure, radiation dose, and so on. And the other way, what we used to say was we could grow a single crystal. And I used to have these nice kind of discussion about why we have to do powder diffraction uh, and, 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 and how you couldn't do single crystal diffraction when you had very small crystals. And unfortunately, or very fortunately, depending how you look at it, they made me change my slides for this talk. Back in February, the guys at the Free Electron Laser published some really exciting results uh, where they've succeeded to look at really tiny crystals. And so this is something that, that for me, is, is completely new. It's not my research. I don't really know a great deal about it. But I think it's going to completely change the outlook for crystallography over the next five to 10 years. So they will open a free electron laser in Hamburg, and this will completely change the way we, we do things for the hardest problem, shall we say. So there's obviously a, a very long list of people that have worked very hard here. I think it's Henry Chapman and Petra Fromm, and then John Spence seem to be the main names. But I guess all of these people will be going to conferences over the next few years and explaining all of this. And, and I suggest you try to learn about it and, and have a look at the paper. Uh, so what they do is they have this, this jet uh, a liquid jet, and inside of the liquid jet, they have crystals. So it's a powder slurry. It's, it's the same kind of samples we use for powder diffraction. And they run it through a filter so that all of the crystals in their slurry are less than two microns in size. So that stops them blocking up the jet, and they fire this off into vacuum. And then they have their, their X-ray pulses coming in. So they have something like a, a seven micron X-ray beam and they have uh, crystals that are less than two microns in size. And these x-rays come in as pulses, very, very intense, very bright x-ray pulses. And if you're lucky, then one of your pulses hits one of your crystals in this jet. And when it does, well, the crystal explodes and gets killed by the, the x-ray laser. But just before it explodes, it diffracts. And you see these wonderful diffraction patterns. And so they have a detector that's far back and a detector that's close to where the diffraction is going on. And they can record these pictures. And they recorded something like three million pictures of, uh, of crystals that were flying past in random orientations. And they went through and analyzed all this data. And I guess these are the, the typical results. Uh, I don't know if they all look so beautiful. But the ones they show in their nature paper, you see these nice fringes in between the diffraction peaks. And by looking at the shapes of the diffraction peaks and by looking at the fringes, they can actually make a picture of how does each one of these individual crystallites look like when it was in the diffraction beam. 
And so they, they, they have a crystal here, it's 290 nanometers in size. They have another one here, it's 160 nanometers. So they have really tiny crystals giving single crystal diffraction patterns, and they just have one diffraction pattern from each crystal. But they repeat this uh, millions of times in different orientations. Uh, and in the end, they have a complete three-dimensional data set for their structure. And what they say in their paper is that they have an 8.5 angstrom data set, which for, for us as small molecule crystallographers or, or, or let's say people that look at atoms, nobody needs to be very worried just yet because 8.5 angstroms you can't actually see very much. Uh, so if we plug that in for the, the protein they looked at, if we did that with, with powders, we'd struggle to get to 12 angstroms, you know, if we could get the thing to diffract strongly. So they're already doing better than what we might predict we would do with a simple powder experiment. And the reason they're limited here is that their, their laser at the moment has a wavelength of six or seven angstroms. And so, so they're limited by kind of the, the, the radiation that they have. But they're building new lasers. There's, there's one being built in Germany and they will have shorter wavelengths, and so in the future you can expect to see this resolution will be pushed up, and I guess that's just a matter of time if you have so many people working full-time on the project. So, to come back into, into what we can do uh, in, in the real world, let's say, or if, if we're not in uh, the free electron laser, so the conventional powders and single crystals. So with a powder we have a big sample, we have a bulk sample, we know that all of our crystals must have been the same inside, we're going to lose some information when the peaks overlap. And I say there's a steep learning curve. So if you want to learn to do powder diffraction quite well, you should come to Ericeo for 10 days and, and do an intensive course all about it. If you want to do protein crystallography, I'd say it's, it's considerably more user-friendly these days. The programs are more invested in, let's say. So they have more programmers with maybe higher salaries. Uh, but on the, on the upside, if you're trying to grow crystals, your polycrystals, so you will often get samples, uh, and they will just pop out quite easily, and you'll get your samples in a wider range of conditions, so you'll have uh, closer to physiological conditions, maybe. And it's easier to get data from your powder, if you can get to a powder beam line, uh, whereas for a single crystal, it's very hard to get a crystal. It's nigh on impossible to go to a free electron laser at the moment, although that may change. Uh, and, and as I say, the conditions can be quite limited for uh, the samples. So if you do do your powder experiment, you're going to be limited in resolution uh, in terms of what you can see in reciprocal space. Uh, when you talk to a protein crystallography, you may say, well, I've got this really high resolution powder pattern, which means you've run it at the synchrotron and you have very sharp peaks in reciprocal space. If, if uh, you're a single crystal person, when you say, I have a high-resolution data set, it means you can see the atoms. So you have high resolution in your electron density map. The completeness will always measure all of the diffraction peaks, uh, whereas with a single crystal, you might not measure all of the, the peaks, you know, especially if you're in a high-pressure pres cell or electron microscope. Uh, but we do have this overlap problem, so we don't really see every peak. And there are some space groups where that's more difficult than others. And then redundancy, they can measure the same peak over and over again. Uh, for us, we can measure different diffraction patterns uh, under slightly different conditions to try to increase the, uh, the information that we have. Uh, so here's, a, here's an example of just some data from a, from a protein showing you know, the single crystal gives these very sharp, intense spots. So you have a great deal of intensity in one single diffraction spot. When you do the powder, the intensity is kind of spread out over the whole ring, and it becomes less intense. This is just spinning or not spinning the sample. So if you were to have a sample like this, and you have these nice diffraction spots, you'd probably be better off to just go and pick one of the crystals and do the single crystal experiment, well, unless, unless you're doing something in situ. Whereas if, if you do the powder experiment, your signal to background is not so good for these peaks as what it was here. So. Coming into to doing uh, the comparison between single crystal and powder diffraction, uh, we sometimes show, Lynn showed a very nice animation of how you add up one crystal at a time in a diffraction pattern. Something we did together with uh, Karthik and, and Elspeth Garman was putting several crystals one at a time, adding up one crystal after the other in the beam and seeing how those add up in terms of the diffraction patterns. And something we've worked on is how can we index multiple single crystals at the same time. So we're doing powder diffraction one grain after the other grain. And we came up recently with some new algorithms for how do you do that. 
So I try to avoid doing too much maths, but something you, you may hear about one day is an orientation matrix, if you ever work with a single crystal. So to index all of these diffraction spots and to treat any single crystal data set, you need to know what this orientation matrix is. And all this is is, is, is just a list of three vectors that correspond to the, the real space unit cell axes. So you can imagine your crystal is on your diffractometer, and somewhere on the diffractometer, the crystal has a C axis. And that's just this, this vector here. And if you find one axis, you can find the H index of the peaks. And so if you want to untangle the diffraction from multiple crystallites, you don't need to find the complete matrix. You just need to find one of the vectors. And then you can, you can start to untangle the peaks just by finding one of these vectors and not all three at the same time. So that's kind of the result there. Uh, so to come into something about data collection towards the end, uh, the, the regular powder diffraction patterns that were being measured were these kind of things with very, very short, strong diffraction peaks measured at the synchrotron. And the protein is, is this little bit down here at very, very low angles and, and very weak peaks. And so the challenge, and the reason why we like to work on this at the synchrotron, is because you want to improve this region as much as possible. And so it really stretches the instrumentation you know, down at two degrees. How can we try to do that better, and how can we try to improve that? So there's, the, there's Andy's beamline with analyzer crystals there, where, where we started out these measurements, uh, following from what Bob had done with Peter Stevens and analyzer crystals. And then we, Bob uh, did some area detector measurements, and, and we were surprised by that. And we, we said, well, that looks like a good idea. So we tried with area detectors too, so these kind of 2D detector images. And this is to overcome radiation damage a little. So radiation damage, when we went from a bending magnet to an undulator, was a huge problem. The, the sample was getting pulled apart in the beam, and you can see it looks very bad. People have shown these things before. And so a great development, this was just after I left, I think, from, from uh, ID31, and he invented this nice spinning device. So it spins the sample, and it translates the capillary along the beam. So you can keep seeing a fresh piece of sample. You can imagine how disappointed we were when, when we first put a protein in the undulator beam and it lasted only two minutes and we had to run you know, across the road to the, to the biology lab to try and fill up another sample in another capillary and put it on the diffractometer. Uh, this, this revolutionized being able to get high resolution data really because you could keep putting fresh sample in the beam. So how to make these, these large samples? Uh, Bob came up with these capped on capillaries which uh, stop you getting glass in your fingers when you're trying to get the, the protein in the sample. These work very well. Uh, and for cryocooling particularly, we find that Kapton works much better than glass for trying to freeze your sample. And that's because Kapton has a much better thermal conductivity. So there's a recipe here from Eve where you take your Kapton tube, you put your protein inside, and you stick another tube up the middle of the sample to make something nice and thin. And that freezes much more quickly. Uh, so what you want to try to do is to get uh, amorphous ice instead of crystalline ice. And this changes what you can do, really. So you have these huge variations in 10 minutes if you don't freeze the sample. And if you do freeze the sample, then you know in one hour it really hasn't changed by very much. So this, this, this changes what you can do completely by being able to freeze the sample. So something uh, that comes up uh, for having collected this kind of data from a cryo called sample is, is how to untangle, you know, you've measured in several positions along the length of a capillary, and as you've gone along the length of the capillary, maybe you've got different kinds of ice peaks, and then the thing's dying in the beam as well at the same time, so you have all these different diffraction patterns, and the diffraction patterns are changing all the time, and you want to decide what can you add together and how can you untangle the mess. So we did some work with uh, cluster analysis. There are commercial packages that are somewhat more polished, for doing this. I think Chris Gilmore has PolySnap, that's very swish, and, and I think uh, Panalytic will have something too. And so you can cluster together to figure out which things you can add together and, and, and how they're changing and so on uh, to untangle the mess. So the 2D detector stuff, I'll, I'll say very little, except that you know 2D detectors are very expensive, uh, and you can try to scan around your 2D detector and then add together the different pictures to try to get something more high resolution. Uh, but that's a lot of work for the instrument scientists to make the data all match up. So it's, it's not on offer in many places. But if you have access, one way to get a cheap, massive 2D detector is to do that. Uh, you can measure data at very high energies, so 0.25 angstrom wavelength. This story of the, of the pattern getting squished up, if you put the detector very far back, you can still have very nice high-resolution data, even with extremely short wavelengths. And that can be interesting for radiation damage. 
Uh, and then I'll just show a comparison of some 2D detector and analyzer crystal data to finish. So usually we show this kind of plot that shows the analyzer crystals are much sharper and the area detector is much worse. Uh, sometimes you're limited by the sample and, and you're not limited by your instrument resolution. And so in that case, it's, it's nice to have the good counting statistics, whereas with analyzer crystals, you struggle for statistics. The peaks are stri slightly sharper. But when you try to measure these, these tiny samples, uh, then you're limited mainly by your samples. So I think I'll, uh, I'll finish there by thanking my colleagues, particularly Irene and, and Andy and all the students that have done the work and so on. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John, for that, that excellent overview. So, time for, for questions. And don't forget there's a there's a large cash prize for, uh, <laughs> for, uh, for those who, who ask the most uh, probing questions. Ah, right. no, don't forget to give, give me your name yeah. and uh, institution. Bulianka Frigako, Berlin, Germany. Uh, what do you think, can the information obtained from small angle scattering experiments, so-called biosex, mostly about their shape, can this information be used in powder diffraction or evaluations like constraints, restraints? Um, so from small angle scattering, there are, as you say, you get these, these shape information out. In principle, you can try to take this kind of shape and fit it into a unit cell to try to see you know, how does the molecule pack into the unit cell. And this would be something like low resolution phasing. Uh, Personally, I would say that if you have a powder diffraction pattern, you can probably do better low resolution phasing by doing crystallography. Uh, you could do combined small angle and crystallography, but say Chris Gilmore's program that does maximum entropy can do quite nice low resolution phasing with powder data already. In practice, we didn't look very much at this because this kind of blob picture of the structure isn't very interesting biologically. Uh, but it's certainly possible to use that information, yeah. Okay, up, right up at the back. Yeah. Uh, so, Danielle Kennedy, CSIRO Australia. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the models that you're inputting to the system, the PDB files. So, you're working with really well-known proteins where the structure's already known and it's logged in the protein database. Is that correct? So it depends. So on lysozyme, the structure is extremely well known. For example, on Ponsin, the structure was unknown. And what we have is a, a homology model. So it means in your protein sequence, you have, say, 60 amino acids. And of your 60, maybe 40 or 50 are the same in another protein. And you have, I don't know, 10 or 20, which are different. And so using the part of the structure that's the same, you can get an initial model to do a, a difference electron density map to see how is the new part of the structure, how is the part that's different. And for many, many proteins, you see in different animals and in, in different species that the protein is just slightly different. And there's a great interest, you know, if I change this amino acid here, how does the function of the protein change? So you know most of the structure, and there's a little bit of it that you're trying to fill in, you know, one end or the other end, or ideally the active site, or where is the ligand binding. But most of the things, I think everything that we've had successful Rietveld fits, there was an initial model to get started. Can I ask the second question? Yeah. Um, the next question is, have you seen any improvement in this, the refinements that you're getting if you've used a cryoprotectant solution rather than just water? I should have explained, we, we have to use a cryoprotectant solution if we freeze, otherwise we just get ice. Um, yeah, so the, the cryoprotectant improves things. Uh, Reina did see cryoprotectant in the electron density maps as well, so sometimes you even see the cryoprotectant in the structure, but uh, that certainly helps for freezing. Yes, right to the uh, how long do you get uh, Name. Laurent Chapon from ISIS? Uh, uh, how long do you get on a free electron laser before you get radiation damage? I mean, the sample so, eventually explodes at the end, but you know how? 
So what, what I understand with the free electron laser is you have one pulse of x-rays that comes in for something like uh, a few femtoseconds long. So it has a, you know, a really finite size in space. And this hits one crystal, and the crystal completely explodes. So you have, well, in the paper somewhere, there's a little graph. You have something like 20 femtoseconds that your sample is in the beam, and then your sample is completely destroyed. And so each one of their diffraction patterns is a new crystal, and they're spraying these crystals into the vacuum. And each crystal gets hit by a, it's a fresh crystal and a fresh uh, X-ray pulse, and they keep repeating the experiment. And so this question of does your X-ray pulse get to the other side of your crystal before the crystal explodes or not has been a, a huge debate in the community of, you know, the X-ray pulse arrives, and what they actually plot in their paper is the length of the pulse versus the diffraction intensity. So they, in the laser as it is now, you have long pulses and short pulses. And if you have a very short pulse, the idea is that if the pulse you know, goes through quicker, you should see different amounts of radiation damage to if your pulse is much longer. So if you have a long pulse, you know, then by the time the back end of the pulse comes through, the crystal's already feeling tired, you know, 100 femtoseconds later. And so they plot the intensity versus the pulse length to try to investigate this, this thing. But it will change, I guess, when they learn how to make shorter pulses as well. Just next question about the x -fill. What is your opinion? Is the interaction between X-ray pearls and protein became time-dependent? That means the diffraction is not longer kinematic, but becomes like something like dynamic in terms of the time, or it's still kinematic? Um, I don't have a strong opinion. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, those. 40, 50 co-authors are working on this, and I think you should probably ask them. Uh, certainly the time and the effort and the money that they're spending to do this suggests that they're, they're really expecting kinematic should work, and, and they've kind of bet billions of dollars that it's going to be kinematic and the data can be analyzed. But uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. I'm Paolo Matteo from University of Bologna. Uh, I'm sorry. It could be a, a, probably a silly question because I don't know about the uh, femto, uh, femto X-ray uh, resolution. Um, I want to know about the rate of crystal flow in that experiment. Is it possible to consider crystals fixed in position according to the um, X-ray pulse? In, in terms of the, the, yeah. the, the free electron stuff? Yeah. So that I think it goes through in femtoseconds at the speed of light. So the flow rate even if the flow rate is really fast, the X-rays go through at the speed of light, so I think you can consider it's not moving. It should, should be uh, effectively stationary. Okay, any more, any more questions? No, in that case, uh, thank, uh, thank John again for his, his thought. Okay, so the, the second speaker is, is Raina Margiolaki, who, as I said, uh, came to the ESRF and helped develop the, uh, the ESRF's uh, efforts in protein powder diffraction. She's, she's returned to her native Greece just about uh, over a year ago, where she's at the University of, of Patras, where she's uh, well, continuing to pursue the technique, and we're, we're very fortunate she still comes to visit us at the ESRF because she has a, a visiting... Uh, uh, visiting visitorship, uh, so we, we we still see quite a lot of her, and she continues uh, uh, in this in this project. And so she's going to give us a a general overview of uh, protein uh, powder diffraction. Good morning. Uh, I hope the microphone works. <laughs> it's a very fancy one. Thank you, Andy. Well, uh, it's very easy to follow from John's presentation because